For centuries, inventors tackled this challenge with determination and frustration. The first snow machines trudged through winters awkwardly and slowly. But by the late 1950s, new technologies and materials emerged to make snowmobiles that could blaze through the snow with increasing ease and comfort. Snowmobilers often face rugged terrain. Snowmobiles need a rock-solid build to keep the riders safe and comfortable. It all begins with an aluminum alloy frame. The pieces arrive partly assembled to the radiator. The robot spins and positions the frame. A computer-guided frame rivet machine punches holes and inserts rivets directly into the frame with great precision. This process bonds the parts tightly so they can't vibrate. Next comes the rear suspension, aimed at making the ride as smooth as possible. Inserting this plastic slide onto the runner minimizes friction between the track and the suspension. A conveyor belt carries the suspension system through several stations. Wheels and sprockets will turn the track that grips the snow. The suspension kit with springs and coils goes directly into the runners. Along with these shock absorbers, the suspension will fit snugly into the snowmobile's frame. Workers tighten everything manually for now. Later, a machine will tighten things even more. Assembling the transmission system starts with this counter shaft. First, they install a high-performance brake disc made of forged steel. The chain case fits snugly on top thanks to the ridges on this ring. This die-cast aluminum casing will house two gears and a chain. This bolt connects to a spring that keeps the gears and chain tight as they turn. The chain tightener must slide smoothly back and forth in its groove to keep the chain's tension even. This test checks that the spring expands and compresses properly. Now comes the oil gauge. It's essential that oil lubricate the parts thoroughly because the motor will generate a lot of friction. The transmission fits on top of the frame. These coils, springs, runners, and wheels fit easily into the rubber track. The rear suspension system connects to the track system while this white plastic sprocket connects the track to the transmission. The speed sensor attaches directly to the sprocket. Four high-grade steel bolts anchor the rear suspension system to the frame. They're so strong that the suspension can withstand the vibrations that come with high speeds. Now for the engine assembly. Bolts attach the electric starter directly to the engine. The fuel-injected engine generates a lot of heat up to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. This shield has layers of insulating wool that act as a heat barrier to protect the driver from scorching hot exhaust. The engine's made of cast aluminum, so it's relatively light, just 100 pounds, and it propels the snowmobile up to 120 miles an hour. Now for the front of the snowmobile. This front suspension system requires a different assembly from the rear one. A hoist brings it all together. The gas tank is made of lightweight molded plastic rather than metal. The throttle controls the speed just like a gas pedal in a car. They install the throttle assembly and a few more functional details. Whether your rig of choice rides on 8, 10, or 18 wheels, trucks have got the goods and they get them to where they have to go. Trucks not only transport most of today's consumables, they're the undisputed kings of the road. Fabricating these massive trucks requires many highly complex steps since the parts are usually heavy and tricky to handle. Assembly begins with the fabrication of the bearing frame. 
the main part on which the truck's cab, motor, and transmission will rest. They begin by assembling these tempered steel stringers, beams varying in length between 25 and 43 feet. The chassis is made as a huge Meccano set. The stringers are solidly attached together with nuts and bolts and tightened with powerful pneumatic tools. Once assembled, the main chassis is transported to another stage of construction. Now they're going to install the mechanical parts. They start with the differential, the axle, and the springs leaves. The brake mounts are then put in place. The plates installed on the mounts allow the truck to brake. They install the wheel hub onto which the wheels will be attached. The transmission shaft, which will power the driving wheels, is inserted. They finish the rear wheel assembly by mounting the heavy brake drum made of cast iron. To facilitate the mounting, everything is assembled upside down. With an overhead crane capable of lifting a 26,000 pound load, they then turn the part right side up. Next step, the motor propulsion elements. The transmission is bolted to the motor, seen here in yellow. The motor propelling elements comprise the clutch and the transmission, installed at the front end of the truck chassis. A truck has between 6 and 10 wheels, 22 inches in diameter. The tire and wheel together weigh about 120 pounds. Because of this heavy weight, the wheels are installed with the help of this powerful tool. This bolt fastener allows tightening of all the wheel nuts at the same time. The mechanical part is ended and they now proceed with the cab assembly. This begins with painting. The cab is moved toward the front to facilitate the installation of various components. This worker attaches the support for the horn to the roof of the truck cab. Now for the cab's interior. They begin by installing the dashboard, which weighs about 80 pounds. Following this, they attach all the wires, the turn indicators, the speedometer, and the pedals. The seats are then installed. The cab work is now all completed. It is bolted onto the chassis. Now for the motor's hood. They finish off with the lights, the exhaust pipe, and the mud guards. The truck is now almost ready to hit the road. They start it up and verify that everything's operating properly, and it's now ready for delivery to the customer. It requires 95 to 100 hours of work to assemble a truck like this. In spite of their 11,000 pound weight, these trucks can move along at a top speed of 75 miles per hour, and they can carry a load of some 30 tons. A vehicle is amphibious when it travels on land and water. This one's used mainly by hunters and fishermen but also by utility companies and the military. Wide, rugged tires easily trek through mud, snow, and bushes. When the vehicle's in the water, the tire's deep treads also function as paddles. This eight-wheel model can carry six people on land and four in the water. Buoyancy requires a lighter load. They begin production by welding eight steel sections together to make the driver's seat then 12 other parts for the vehicle's main frame. This frame will later house the seat, a gas tank, the battery, and a storage box. 
Next, a worker assembles what's called the axle hook. A robotic press punches five bolts through the components to fuse them. This design keeps the hub lightweight and strengthens the axle for driving on rough terrain. Next, a worker inserts what's called the axle shaft through the hub. A robotic welding machine then fuses the shaft to one side of the hub. After he flips it, the machine welds the shaft to the hub's other side. This company uses a robot for this important step because it's faster and more precise. Here, a worker reveals some of the vehicle's secrets to functioning in water. Each axle's bearing has rubber and steel collars called flanges. They form a waterproof seal over the axle. The worker greases these flanges to lubricate them and to keep dust and water from infiltrating. He inserts one of 16 gaskets between the flanges. They're made of cork to keep moisture out and grease from escaping. After adding another flange and a gasket, he applies a liquid compound to rust-proof the steel shaft. Here, a computer-guided cutting tool carves teeth on a steel ring to create one of the vehicle's 17 gears. Lubricant cools the heat this generates so that the machine doesn't overheat and break down. When the cutting's complete, robotic arms remove the gear and replace it with a new unshaped ring. The gears range from about the size of a coin to the size of a dinner plate. Here's how the shift lever changes the gears from neutral to low to high and into reverse. And here's how the clutch will transfer power via a component called the input shaft into the transmission. A worker hooks up the transmission to the engine. Then he slides two clutches onto the input shaft. He attaches each one with a bolt and two washers, then connects the engine to the transmission with a rubber drive belt encircling the clutches. Two brake calipers connect the brake system to the transmission. Now we test the drive belt, clutch system, engine rotations, brakes, and steering. The wheels don't turn. The driver steers the vehicle by slowing or braking either set of wheels and skidding to one side. To make the vehicle's lower body, they take a sheet of polyethylene, a heavy-duty plastic, and heat it in an oven. After four and a half minutes at 450 degrees Fahrenheit, the sheet emerges, softened by the heat. An aluminum mold drops down, and a vacuum-forming machine stretches the plastic around it, sucking out the air from between the two. After the plastic cools for four and a half minutes, the machine lifts the mold, leaving a cavity about the size of a large bathtub. Two workers then move the lower body to an assembly line. They insert the vehicle's mainframe, now painted black. Then on the outside, they mount four extensions that'll carry the vehicle's two front and two rear axles. These will enable the axles to withstand greater punishment. They install eight drive chains onto sprockets on the axle shafts. Then two more linking the transmission to the components that propel the vehicle, what's called the drive system. A worker then attaches an end plate to complete the link. Workers lower the 26 horsepower engine into the carriage and attach it with three bolts. Next, the polyethylene upper body and then the wheels. They test the drive chains for tension and sprockets for vibrations. The wheels are twice as wide as most car wheels, but 10 times softer to cushion the ride. On land, this $16,000 vehicle travels up to 21 miles per hour. Top speed in the water is only three miles an hour, but hey, it's easier than swimming. Human beings have always generated garbage. In the battle to keep the streets clean, the mechanized garbage truck is a combat vehicle. It crushes tons of trash en route to deliver it to landfills, incinerators, and recycling facilities. Without it, we'd all be knee-deep in garbage. Garbage trucks have different approaches to handling garbage. Some load from the front, others from the rear or side. And some are entirely mechanized, like this side loader truck. The operator inside the cab barely needs to lift a finger, as the hydraulic lift arm does all the heavy work. The garbage truck has come a long way since it hit the street in 1952. 
Production on a modern side loader truck begins with the welding robot. The robot fuses numerous steel supports to the truck body floor. These supports will allow the truck to hold up to the force of tons of trash being compacted inside. Meanwhile, down the line, other parts like the roof and sides take shape in separate assemblies. Once they're complete, they hoist the large steel parts into place and assemble them within a metal framework. The framework serves as a guide to piece together all the parts of the truck box. Once assembled, the workers clamp the parts together to secure the assembly as they weld the seams. The garbage truck body is then ready for the mechanized parts, beginning with a hopper. It's equipped with a powerful hydraulic compactor to squeeze as much trash as possible into the truck. They fit the hopper snugly to the front of the truck body and weld it to it. Then they lift the tailgate into position at the rear of the truck box. They hinge it to the truck by sliding heavy-duty steel pins through brackets. Once hinged, the tailgate can swing up and out of the way to allow garbage to be discharged. The driving force for this is a pair of hydraulic cylinders attached by brackets welded to the tailgate at one end and the truck body at the other. With that job done, these cylinders can now extend to lift the tailgate and retract to close it. Across the factory floor, another team assembles a pair of steel lift arms. These lift arms are designed for another kind of truck, the front end loader. It's mainly used to collect hefty commercial garbage containers. In action, these arms pivot around the truck cab and extend to the front to fork up the trash container and deposit the contents in the hopper. Hydraulic cylinders also power these lift arms. When the task is complete, the forks at the end of the arms fold back out of the way. Nearby, workers test this rear loader garbage truck. Its tailgate is split into two hoppers, one for recyclables and the other for trash. Hydraulic systems lift them one at a time or simultaneously. Collecting garbage and disposing of it can be tough on a truck's paint job, so they apply an extra durable finish. They spray sealer on the sanded outer surface, followed by two coats of epoxy paint. After that, they bake on the layers. Meanwhile, the truck chassis has arrived from another factory. It's a standard size, so they chop a piece off to size it for the garbage truck body. They install bracket plates at the back and slide thick pins through the holes to join the truck body to the chassis. Using a crane, they lift the automated side loader truck body onto the modified chassis. Once it's installed, they test the compactor. Dual hydraulic cylinders push the ejector blade to the back of the truck. They test the tailgate, which has by now been equipped with signal lights, mud flaps, and other parts, and verify that everything functions properly. Once a truck passes muster, it's ready to handle whatever garbage society throws its way. And with these automated garbage trucks, there's no need for anyone to strain their back or get their hands dirty because these robot arms can handle it.